Um, how many did your devotions this morning? <laughs> maybe, maybe just in your heart, raise your hand if you did it. You know, isn't it easy on Sunday morning, you're going to church anyway, so you get a little extra sleep, and so you miss out on something like a devotional or something like that. And I had, over, the, over time, because I'm preaching a sermon, I go, to, I go to bed looking at it, I wake up, and I grab it, and I go down to my office, and I open it up, and I look at it down there. And because I'm preaching a sermon, that, that can just fulfill some, spending some time with the Lord. After all, I'm sharing things of the Lord. Right? Amen. Yeah, you've been there. Amen. And I, I had let this devotional time slip, on Sunday mornings especially. I don't like to admit that, but, I want, but you need to hear that. And so then I had this devotional book today that I opened up and I read to Pastor Josh. I read it first, I read it for, for me. And then he came in and I said, you've got to hear this. Um, and since so many of you missed your devotionals, I, uh, <laughs> you're going to get a devotional as we get started today. It's a little, little bonus I get this thrown in. Because of this whole getting to know him better and getting to know the Lord, there's this part that, take, that took me back in time for just a moment to just stop and think. And of all books, for me, it was a devotional that was given to me. It was called A Look at Life from a Deer Stand. I know you all can't wait to get this book. <laughs> but you got to hear it, so you're going to hear this devotional. It's called Skipping in the Dark. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I'll help you. Man, I want to know him better. There are very few parts of the deer hunt that I dislike. Perhaps the untimely onslaught of gnats that seem to invade only when the deer is moving toward my stand would be on the list. They must love adrenaline. The sight of a passing pair of coyotes that scatters the deer herd, leaving me with an early trip back to the truck, and it's a bummer. These things are terribly bothersome, but there's another part of hunting I don't care for at all, even after 35 years in the woods, it's the early morning treks to the stand by myself in the pitch black darkness of the pre-dawn forest. I know you're all tough and you don't think about anything, but yeah. I'm always grateful when another hunter is along. Having company puts the joy back into the journey. Instead of being reduced to a shaky, tentative shuffle through the forest, the presence of a companion brings a lilt to my steps. The imagination that would be hindered by thoughts of a deadly attack by a cougar, a grizzly, or the boogeyman is freed instead to look forward to the hunt. We stopped there this morning. We said, you know, isn't it amazing that even when we're walking with a, taking a young person with you into the woods, somebody that's small and can do nothing to help you, that just having them along, I feel good again. I, I don't even think about the dark when they're with me. Isn't that crazy? If anything, I have more responsibility, but it just goes away, just having somebody else along. There's something familiar about how the presence of a friend squelches the struggle of moving alone through the blackness of the woods. It's the comfort of our Heavenly Father gives to those who depend on Him for safety in this world. This is beautifully illustrated in the following poem by Lila Lehman Gustafson. It's a true story of a father and his little girl who had brought him to comfort years before when he was facing a time of great testing. The verses were read at her father's funeral. Now listen, skipping in the dark. She trembled with fear as they entered the night, the shadows like shrouds o'er the land. She whimpered, I'm scared of the darkness ahead. He said, here, my child, hold my hand. She offered hers up, she clasped, it in his, her wee little fist in his palm, the strength of his grip and the love of his touch to her quivering heart brought a calm. Her fears now allayed and her courage restored, she bounced by his side with a lark. And a feeling the grasp of his hand on hers, she said, look, I can skip in the dark. Her daddy looked down at his dear little girl, so trusting, so sure of his care. For though she could not see the path in the dark, she feared not, for Daddy was there. 
the Lord sent a message through his little girl that bolstered his own troubled mind. I'm ever with you. I'll guard every step wherever your pathway may wind. For I am thy God. I'll hold your right hand. Fear not, dear one. I'll help thee. Fear not. I am continually here by your side, still holding your hand. Trust in me. With tears in his eyes, he looked up to the heavens. The stars gave brightness to night. God prodded his heart. There's no darkness on earth that can ever extinguish the light. Look up, hurting child, and give me your hand. There's a light on your pathway so stark. My hold will not fail. You're secure in my grasp. You too, child, can skip in the dark. <laughs> Doesn't that make you just want to know the Lord even better? To just present his presence and just trust him. I so desperately need to start with that when I read that today. It's like the Lord doesn't just have you do things for no reason. He, he includes things that aren't just for me. It's for, it's for all of us. It's who he is. He's for all of us. In doing so, the psalm came to mind. I would read it for you. Psalm 91, 1 through 7. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. I love that David just speaking of the knowing of his God, knowing, knowing full well of his presence and who he is and being secure in that. And it's so important that we become secure in that. I couldn't help that in my looking at this knowing God better, I'm all over A.W. Tozer, The Pursuit of God. That's a book you got to read every single year, at least once. And to go through it again is just, uh, it, it just, it's, it's, it's just brand new all over again. Bring such good reminders. So there's going to be a few things in here, The Pursuit of God by Tozier. There's a verse that he uses in following hard after God. It says, my soul, this is Psalm 63, verse 8. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. See, just, it's, it's speaking, the scripture is speaking to, to, to God's presence in our life and who he is. And then he wrote this. I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present low estate. The lack of pursuing him and what it has done and what it has brought us down to. I'm not talking about, when, I, when we talk about longing after God, I'm not just talking about creating more more. Bible studies that are self-absorbed so that I can promote myself. It's about the presence of the Lord. It's about expressing Jesus, about who he is, about what he's calling to do. It's about him fulfilling that in a life. It's not making sure that I'm seen or that I'm known. It's all about that he is seen, that he is known, that he is introduced and found by people, by men and women, that people would, would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not just more head knowledge of me just building myself up. It's not just me being anxious about this whole part of saying, oh, I've got this Bible and I can't wait to have Bible study. And, and it, Don't tell me this has never happened. This thing is all marked up. And there has been times... That I had to catch myself in this, that I was pretty happy to be sitting next to people when the pastor called a section of scripture where I flipped it over. Oh, and it was just ink all over that thing. You almost like want to just scoot a little closer to them so they can see that look, look how much I've been studying right there. Just to let you just see what I've got. Don't pretend like if it was yours, you wouldn't think the same. Or have a moment where you did. See, we get self absorbed. And it becomes about us. You know, when I was in construction, I, built, I was, worked for a builder for 13 and a half years, way back in the day. 
And you always hated the day you had to get a new tool belt. You'd wear that thing out, man, and there was, there was, it was cut up, and it was ragged, and it was broken, and it was just so nice, and there was glue all over it, and just all, just, it just was a mess, but man, it really did. And then there's a day where it just kind of falls apart, and then you get a brand new one. And boy, the guys let you have it then. You show up with that brand new crisp new tool belt on, and hey, who's the new guy? Oh, man. And the customers are looking at you, and it looks like you're the guy that doesn't know anything because you got this stiff little tool belt. You're walking like you showed up on the first day. <laughs> They're all keeping an eye on you. But there's something about having a Bible that's just used, and you're into it, and you're reading it, but not for pride reasons. It's for getting to know the Lord. I mean, all those colors, otherwise just... It shows that I have a lot of pens and I can mark a lot of different colors and anybody can do that. I can, just, I can open this up. I want to look good, so I'm going to start just underlining stuff. I don't even know what it means. I just start marking all up, so I sit next to you. Hey, Dylan, what do you think? Huh? I'm something, man. It's all marked up right there. Just not, No, I know how to color. <laughs> we need to get in the presence of the Lord where we know him. We intimately know him. The power of his presence. This goes on to say, the stiff and wooden quality of our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present, or there'll be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. How bad do you want him? We sing songs like, oh, more of you, God, more of you, God, more of you, God. No, it's more of you. There is no end to him. Man, when we just start releasing ourselves to him, he's going to flow on us like a, like a river. He'll flow on us like, a, like streams of life. It's, it's like there is no end to him. The, the end is when we decide to put a stop on it and caps him down and start making just, just all these little things about like, oh, just, it's just, oh, he just, he's small and in a box. Man, he's, he's mind blowing. I, I can't even begin to explain him. And I want to be around people who just, I can't understand what's going on. I can't get it or grasp it or even begin to. I need God's presence to just unfold on me that I can even begin to express to you who he is and what he's trying to do. I don't know. He's a great God. And there is no end to him. When I get to where I think I've learned the end of him, it's just I'm still at the very beginning of him. It's overwhelming. It really is. He waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. And I'm so glad that God puts people in our life that and he has lately for me. There's people in my life now who are just desperately seeking after God. There's other people that I'm in my life that there's just constantly these walls, like there's, 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 there's something wrong. There's some search for your desire for something that isn't lining up with God, and I, and I don't have this kindred spirit. There's others they can't stop talking about Jesus, and they can't stop expressing who Jesus is, and they can't stop. They just they, everything about them, what they do, it's like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I find myself just drawn to wanting to be with them and around them and hear about what they're doing and get behind it. It's a, you, you can just see it's, it's all about who they are. Jesus, 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 and, and it's genuine. You can feel it. And you just know it. And God releases that together in us. Well, wow! I just think, man, the holy fire that just starts and that happens. So there's this prayer that Tozer said that hit me, and it's going to hit you. I say that with confidence because I think the people that, that doesn't hit, you, you're so stuck. You just, just listen. Father, I want to know thee, but my cowardly heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting. I come trembling, but I do come. Please root from my heart all those things which, have, which I have cherished so long, and which have become a very part of my living self, so that thou mayest enter and dwell there without a rival. Then shalt thou make the place of thy feet glorious, 
Then shall my heart have no need for the sun to shine in it, for thyself will be the light of it. And there shall be no night there. In Jesus' name, amen. I just love that we come with trembling and we get real. We pour ourselves out before the Lord because we understand the mess of us. We give Him that rightful place. There is no rival. More and more I've been running into people who have done just that. I know people who who are professionals in their field for what they do. And they have like totally in some way just given up. Some have given up just have given up hunting. They love hunting, they give up hunting. Because it was an idol to them. Some of you have other idols. I, I sat in a, a truck this week. Guys, guy, are you here? Guy Zook? Probably he doesn't want to be pointed out if he's here. Are you here? Say something. He's not in here today. He might be having to do something. Well, we'll tell a story about Guy Zook because he's not here. <laughs> he was a professional in his field. He, he shot world record level turkeys in an open calling competition with just the mouth call of a turkey. He came in second place in the world. By a, it was, I forget what he said, it was a point or two. And I was with him in a, in a picture. I didn't know this. The guy never talks about it. Because he, all he talks about is Jesus. He has totally laid this stuff down. I, you would never even know it. He has surrendered it and given God the rightful place so until we pull up against these turkeys that were outside the truck. And I look out, and they're kind of, they're kind of flapping and making the noise the turkey make. I can't even begin to do it. And they were like, they're like fighting it out a little bit and like kind of looking at each other like they didn't know what they were going to do. And all of a sudden, I felt like I had a turkey sitting in the front seat right here. I'm at the windows down, and I hear this, this clucking and calling. And the turkeys went crazy when they heard it. They started just attacking each other and jumping. And I look, look over, what the world? Where did that come from out of this guy? He just started laughing, and that's what he told me. Yeah, I was second in the world. <laughs> <laughs> he sounded like the real deal. If he was here, I just had him do it. You'd be shocked. And where you could go with something like that. But in comparison to Jesus, it's nothing. And he just cast it aside. And that's, God doesn't use him in other ways with some of the passions that he instilled in his soul in different ways. In probably ways that brings his, far, his, his, his heart far more joy than it ever would have before. But he had to lay it down. So God could do in him what he was intending to do. And all of us start to knowing God at that level, just to, to know him, to press into him, to feel his presence, to join together with people of, of like-mindedness in them. It says, Toja wrote this, Come near to holy men and women of the past, and you will soon feel their, their heat of their desire after God. That's what I'm loving, is that I can get in Scripture and I can find this, but I can also find this with people that he is putting around me now who have this heat and this desire after God. And so when you start to, to, to read in Scripture what he has done in the people in Scripture, it's amazing how you start to see those, those parallels in people where he's working big time in their life. And the, and the other ones just start to get exposed fast. Boy, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit religious. It's a little bit about Jesus, but it's a lot about me in the middle of it. And they're maneuvering their way through it. And people are drawing to them because it's sprinkled on with a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of a Bible study, a little bit. Wow, man, just break free. It's all about him. In Scripture, Moses longed for God. In the book of Exodus, he said, Oh God, show me thy glory. See, they wanted to taste and touch. They wanted to feel God's presence on their hearts to a boldness of just, oh God, show me your glory. Man, I want to know you in the power of your presence. Oh God, I've become just desperate for you. And we try to take on too much for ourselves. Man, I relate, I relate to the moment when I try to take on too much for myself. It was at the depot, and I... I, I the, the Lord showed it to me, and so it will be a forever story for me. 
Some of you have heard it, some people haven't. So you're going to hear it again or you'll hear it for the first time. But in that office that day when I said, Lord, I think that I can minister better to these people. Lord, if you allow me to feel what they're feeling. So I can speak right to the hearts of them. When I come out, I will know, I will know exactly, Lord, that, that it's you. And I'll, I'll, be able to, I'll, I'll be able to speak right to their hearts. Let me feel what they're feeling, Lord. And he granted me that prayer. And I stepped into the room from that little back room and stepped in to the depot. The room was full. And my feet hit the floor in there, and I could not breathe. I kid you not. I tried to get a grasp of air, and people were starting to talk to me. I was, I, oh, if somebody's ever sat on your chest, you can't breathe? Have you ever been had the air knocked out of you? And you're just struggling for that breath? I was trying to find that breath. I could not find that breath. And I knew immediately what I had asked for and what had just happened as I felt the pressure of the world in just that room. That was my world at the moment, but this is not the whole world. And I turned went right back in there and I asked for forgiveness before I walked in. Lord, it's not for me to carry. We are presenting it. Look, you need Jesus because he is the one who carries this. He's the one that will be your source. He's the one that will be your everything. So let me point you to him. And that's where you're set free. And that's what he did. And that's what he does. And that's what he still does today. God, show me your glory. Lord, let me get real. Let me not hide, Lord, and just be, just the, I can't, the fakeness just, it just drives me crazy sometimes. We just don't get real. And David's life was a torrent of spiritual desire. He his psalms ring with the cry of the seeker and the glad shout of the finder. In Psalm 34, 8, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. That's, that's his words. Taste and see. Man, get to know him. Get into his word. Paul confessed in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ, yes, the power of his resurrection and in participation of his sufferings, becoming like him in death. Wow. A prayer like that? I want, to, I, want to know him, I want to know him so well that I understand that he's taking me beyond this life. He's taking me to this life and to the grave and beyond the grave. Man, what a great God we serve that even the grave can't hold us. But we have to seek him with all of our heart. Better put this back on. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a favorite verse of mine. And many of you, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. It comes after a place of exodus era of um, in Jeremiah where they're in exile. And God's reminding the people that I have a plan for you. And it's like this, verse 12, then you will call on me and pray to me and I'll listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. And sometimes we're going to come up against things that won't make sense in the middle of the seeking. And we think God's not present, but he is. Because it's not our normal way that we're used to doing life. There was a friend of mine growing up who was telling me that he went to, with some other kids, and they were all over at the house, and, and when the kids used to go outside and play, and... and to find other kids, which you had to do then. And so they, a big game of hide and seek broke out, except there was one kid there who was blind. And it was his turn to find the people that were hiding in the game of hide and seek. You think, well, boy, we can have fun with that. Because you could literally hide anywhere. You could just move over here and just stand right here. You can't see me anyway, I'm just going to stand still. He says it was amazing how it was his turn. He got in the middle and he stood there. He said, and once he stood there, everybody felt trapped. You couldn't hardly breathe. You couldn't move because his senses were so on. He said, I reached over to the bike handle and I went, ding, 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 ding. He said, his head was just like this, just snapped over, <laughs> totally busted out. That's what it has to be with the Lord, that we start to trust him so much there'll be parts that won't make sense. And I won't be able to see what you're doing, Lord, but let, let me slow down and let me listen to you, Lord. Let me hear your voice. And it becomes all oh, so clear. Instead of just your, your 
just going through life and just the way you see it and the way you do it and the way you're going to do it and the next plan that you have. Put your plans aside and start listening to the Savior. And all the things will start making aware to you. All the things that you'll hear. The things will show you. Don't be an old Eeyore. How many remember Eeyore? How many of you have Eeyores in your life? Huh? Just look at me and go like this. <laughs> and, I, and I'll know they're in the room. <laughs> yeah, we have Eeyores in our life. It, we're, we're just, you're, you're, trying, you're saying how much we trust the Lord, how much we want the Lord to be evident in our life. But man, they are just, they got the downside of everything. It's, it's, ama- it's like amazing how much they can just flip and find the negative to everything that comes up. Just come in there, and then just, just, just everything about them just downtrodden, and no, and then, well, that's not going to work because of this, and that's I don't know how this is going to go, and well, you don't know what, oh, it's just so awful now. This person said this to me, and uh, oh, and this was I don't know what to say about this, and I don't know if the money's going to come in, and I don't know if a job is going to happen, and I don't know, yeah, I don't, you want to hang out with me? <laughs> well, no wonder you don't have any friends. May start living in the joy of the Lord about what the Lord is doing. Man, I'm going to look right past it and say, look, I don't understand, but I know what God has done in my life. He saved me. He set me free in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to let me get get me down, but I'm going to go forward and give him praise. What do you want to do today, man? Let's just in the name of Jesus, let's go do something where we're going to get excited about what God is doing. I'm not going to live in this mess. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, let's hang out. That changes things a little bit, doesn't it? We've got to get in that spot, that place where we're not just reciting what isn't happening. My goodness, do you even know the Lord? Let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Wow. We hear this from David and Paul, and I can't think of, as I think about this, I can't think of, if, if it was a locker room speech of an Eeyore, can you imagine how much things would change at halftime of, in the locker room? You come in, you're down, you know, a couple touchdowns down, you get in the locker room. I don't know, guys. They beat us up pretty bad. Probably going to only get worse the second half. <laughs> so just endure to the end. <laughs> Wouldn't have a job for very long, would you? Because too many times you see that the halftime, when things aren't looking like what you want them to go and how it has, not what you expected, that things flip as they make adjustments at halftime. We're going to make adjustments. We're going to do things different. We can see what the enemy is trying to do to take us out. And now we're going to make adjustments and go out and play this game differently. We're only at halftime. we got a whole other half to go. Why is your head in the sand? Why do you have your head down? Pick it up. Do you know who you are? Man, you start speaking life. And speaking what's positive about what's going to happen and why we're going to change this. And all of a sudden, man, the whole energy picks up. And that's who God is. We come here and we just get revved up for what he's going to do. Yeah, you might have had a rough week. It might have been tough on you. We're coming in here and say, but my God is so good. I went in there, I'm charged up. We're going out for a lot more this week for what he's got because my God is going to change somebody's life with the, with, with the interactions he's going to give me, the way he's going to use me. I'm, not, I'm, not even going, to, I'm going to let God take care of this mess. So you quit trying to keep your hands on it all and do it all the time. One of the biggest things that set my wife free one time is when I went to her about all the struggle that was going on in a certain situation. I kept going to her, to her, to her. And I tell you what, it was, I almost found joy in just being able to put all the pressure on her. Tina, what are you going to do? Tina, did you say this? Tina, there was one day she looked at me and she goes, you're going to have to ask the Lord. And I was like, what? She goes, I'm not carried anymore. I'm not doing it anymore. She says, I gave it all to the Lord. You're going to talk to him. Quit asking me. He's the one that has it. I don't. Man, I didn't know what to do. Because I was arguing with her, and every now and then you get riled up, you get some interaction, like, yeah, now I'm getting somewhere. I got her riled up, yeah, now we're, now we're accomplishing something. Now we're accomplishing anything. Then you go to the Lord, they're talking to him, but he convicts you, like, oh, man, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know. Okay, Lord, it's yours. I'm not arguing about it anymore. You know, it gets things in perspective really fast. And that's where we got to get that, that walking, working relationship with him to know him and the power of his resurrection in and through our life. There's these power scriptures I want to read to you as, as David 
poured them out, and I just want—I didn't even put them to the screen because this is one of those moments of time where you just need to listen and not read, not see. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So just hear it. Hear it. Let it get into your spirit. Psalm sixty-three, one through four. You God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I'll praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I'll lift up my hands. Oh, the freedom to say, Jesus, I'm just yours. Oh, Lord, I don't know what else to do. I just lift my hands. And I praise you. Oh, God, I give you glory. Lord, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand what you're doing. But, God, I trust you and I love you. I will forever praise you is what David's saying. So I will do the same. Psalm 34, 1 through 8. I will extol or I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is he who takes refuge in him. Yeah, there was something that came out and hit me right in the head. It was a view. <laughs> Some of you might have thought you were crazy, but I'm telling you you weren't because it hit me right in the head, whatever it was. It was some bug. <laughs> I think, man, that guy's got nerves of steel. I'm, I'm, look, I will not fear. I'm reading it. Why would I be afraid? Whatever's going to land on me doesn't matter. The Lord says, I'm going to send you an example right in the middle of reading about fear. Don't be afraid. What? Not afraid. <laughs> there he goes. He's gone in the name of Jesus. <laughs> if you didn't see it before, now you just saw it. I said you weren't ready to see it. So you've been looking at the screen. You might have missed it. <laughs> Lord had something for you right there. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians 10, 3, 10 through 14. I want to know Christ. He has to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I go on in the name of Jesus. I press on in the name of Jesus. I keep going forward in the name of Jesus. I'm not looking back. And when I do look back at all, it's only to remember how far or what he's rescued me from. Because somebody along the way might need to know that, hey, God rescued me from that, and he can rescue you too. It's not that this is to revel in it and worry about it and let it just strain me or pull me down. It's just God has too much going forward for you in this life. And we see it all over in Scripture. We see it where Jesus had to stand up and just, just was so intense about getting the gospel. He stood and he shouted to the crowds. They were, so, they were so large. And some of us need to shout out that we need Jesus. We see desperation happen in Scripture. When they needed the Lord, they shouted out. The blind man shouted in Mark 10, 46 and 47, appealing for sight. It says, then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together. There's a large crowd. They were leaving the city. And the blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting on the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
Man, when you see that you need Jesus, you're not being quiet anymore. You're shouting out that I need him. Peter stepped out on the water. He asked the Lord, can I come out on the water? Matthew 14, 29 through 30. And Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, see, he saw the storm. He focused on that. He was afraid. He began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. He shouted. It was a demon-possessed man. In Mark 5, 2 through 7, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out. He cut himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from a distance, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him and he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. And Jesus cast the demons out. They were gone. You know, what makes us think that, man, that's just so far off and somewhere else? Because I keep thinking, what controls you that you need to shout out to the Lord? In what way are you sinking that you need to shout out? In what ways can't you see what the Lord is doing and you need to shout out and need to touch with Jesus? What is it? One of my favorite stories of our time is when Jackson Sinyanga spoke about the satanic high priest. There's so much demonic activity in Uganda that's, that's just there. and They see all these, these things firsthand that we have hidden in so many ways here in our complacency. But the satanic high priest was out to destroy him, to even kill him, to take him out, to prove that Jesus wasn't real. And so when they started their, their meeting and the people gathered and they preached about who Jesus was and there was gates to come in, he could freely come in, he circled around the outside. He was going to come in and make a spectacle of him. And for days they had this meeting and kept coming. He kept circling, kept circling, kept circling. And they just kept having the meeting. Till finally they finished telling everybody that, that came all about Jesus. And then he finally came and got to Jackson and said, I was coming here to try to kill you, to take you out. Except there was no way in. He said, I kept trying to get around and there was angels with, with these beings that had sores drawn all around a perimeter and I couldn't, I couldn't get through. And Jackson said, yet yeah, every gate was wide open for those that wanted to come to Jesus could come. But the one who had ill intent could not get in. It so impacted him that he surrendered his life to Jesus. And he called on the name of the Lord and he was saved. That's what you need. That dry, thirsty soul that you have, that hurting, that wondering, that emptiness that you feel, no matter what you try, no matter what you try to do to fill it, it fills with Jesus. That's how. He's the answer. He's what makes you whole. He's what fills the emptiness. He's what brings that fountain of flowing to your spirit that those who drink from him would never thirst again. That's what you need. So I'm going to pray for you today in this room. I'm going to pray. If the Lord has touched your heart, raise your hand over here. See over there? Pastor Josh, yeah, Pastor Josh too. If the Lord has touched your heart, you make your way right over there and let them, just, just come and get yourself before the Lord and pray. When we rise to sing, you move and go there. 
So rise to your feet right now if you would. And I want to pray. So just stand. Lord, we now stand before you. Lord, we stand before you with our heads bowed, Jesus. And we say you are such a great God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for meeting us in this place. And God, I pray there would be a holy desire of hearts searching and pursuing you and seeking you with all their hearts, Lord. Even today, as something was stern, there would be a movement of God in this place where you would join us and unite us in this calling of God, Lord, that our schedules would change and we would unite together, we would get together, we'd join together in the ways that we can join together, Lord, that we would pray together and call on you. Lord, we pray that we would not have a spirit of fear in this place to move, Lord, that we would get up, we'd move and walk to you and call on you, Lord. We call on you today because you are listening, Lord. You hear us when we seek you. The Bible is telling us that, so thank you for that, Lord. As we sing today, I pray, God, that there will be people who will move to you. Fear will be banished, Lord, as they just come to you, surrender their lives to you completely, surrender situations to you completely, surrender any, any worries or anxieties, Lord, cast out in the name of Jesus. Thank you that we can meet you here in this way today, Lord. We give you all praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.